Good morning. All right, I want to welcome you to Christ Community Church. We are going to get started. We're still in a little bit of finding seats for everybody. Uh, just so you know, there's plenty of space in the first service as well. Uh, <laughs> plenty. Well, this, it, it, when we got, when we, I don't know if anyone can hear me. Is this on? You hear it? Can you hear me? Where's the, where's the? All right, good morning. I want to welcome you to Christ Community Church. We're going to get this turned up a little bit so you can hear me more easily. Um, we want to say welcome if you are a member or a regular attender. We're so glad to see you. If you're a vet visitor, we want to offer you a special welcome. We're so glad that you came to worship with us today. Thanks, Jason. I can hear. I, if I can't hear myself, I know you can't hear me, so this is good. Uh, if you are a visitor, we'd love to get a welcome card from you. We have welcome cards out in the foyer or in the hallway out here. We have some welcome cards downstairs, but you can also text your welcome card. Text CCC guest in 94,000. I'll take you to a digital welcome card. Also, that same number, if you text the word bulletin to it, will take you to our digital bulletin, which has all the information you need for uh, upcoming events and financial updates as well. Uh, we want to say a quick thank you. We probably had about eight to ten families who came out to help with the YMCA 5K. I was, had a great time. Uh, I injured myself, and I know I'm getting old when I injured myself, and I wasn't even racing. Like I bent down to pick up a cup on the ground, and my back went out. So if you see a grimace, uh, <laughs> that's the grimace. Uh, but we also had a, a number of our members go through CPR training in order to uh, be certified for our nursery also, in order to help babysit for foster families, so thanks for everyone who came out to that. A few other upcoming events. First of all, we have Hot Dog Hangout. After church today, we're going to go out. The Alvarados are going to be cooking some hot dogs for us out at the park. Uh, so come on out to that. We've we got plenty of hot dogs, chips, water. It's a great time just to get to know each other and also reach out to our community. Also coming up... <clears throat> We have a next step meeting. I feel like it's been two months since we've done one of these. Uh, but if you want to become a member or if you're just curious about who we are as a church, this next step luncheon is for you. Uh, what we do is we have a barbecue sandwich and we just sit and we talk about our values as a church and we get to hear each other's stories. That's going to be at the Watson house. That's gonna, uh, it's going to be at my house. Lindsay and I will host that meeting on the 2nd. Uh, so you can RSVP by talking to me and make sure I write it down while you're talking to me or else I'll forget about it. Or you can email office at Christ.community and say you want to go to the Next Step class and we will give you all the information. And then finally, uh, we have a Ladies Spring Fellowship. Our Ladies Spring Fellowship, we've done this uh, the last few years. Well, last year was canceled, but the year before that we did it and it was a great time. Uh, so many ladies came out, and what we do is we'll meet at somebody's house. I believe it's Shelly Walker's front this go-around, uh, and they'll just have a fellowship, but kind of get to know each other more and develop those shared memories and friendship. That's going to be on May 1st, 1 to 3, Shelly Walker's yard. You might say, how do I know how to get to Shelly's yard? Uh, if you filled out a visitor card you should be on our mailing list. So if you're on our mailing list, that address will come via your email. If you're not on our mailing list, just let me know and we can get you on there. Uh, and that way you can get all those updates as well. 
All right, Christ Community Church, let us stand for our call to worship. In Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 3, verse 5, it says this about our Lord Jesus Christ. He saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Christ Community Church, let's lift our voices and sing praise to the one who saved us by his mercy. For 
my soul, for my soul to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. Thanks for being flexible as we sorted out chairs this morning. Um, now is the time in our service where we get to corporately confess our sins to our righteous and holy God who can only declare us righteous by the work of Christ on the cross. I heard a good illustration in the first service from our other elder, Jeremiah. I thought I'd share it with you guys for this service as well. When you're learning to drive and you have your hands on the wheel, you're always so focused on the direction you're going, right? Because there's a good fear of what could possibly happen. But over the course of time, we grow more and more relaxed. We may um, pick up some food to eat or maybe our phone to text as we drive. And what happens is our eyes begin to go away from the road in the direction that we're headed onto other things that tend to distract us. And much um, like those instances in the Christian walk, we tend to begin to divert our eyes onto other things. And church is a great opportunity for us to recenter, refocus on the road ahead of us so that our eyes um, are no longer distracted. But yes, we are set forth on the course before us. And in this text in 1 Peter 2.25, we are reminded that for we are like sheep going astray. Our eyes are straying from the road set before us. But it's through confession that we now return to the shepherd who is the overseer of our souls. So Christ Community Church, confess the ways your eyes have strayed off of Christ and onto other things and spend the next few moments asking the Lord to forgive you because only he can. First Peter 2.24 says that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree 
so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. For by his wounds, you have been healed. Through the work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection, we are healed and we are forgiven of our sins. You can be assured of the forgiveness you have in Christ when you look to that cross. Father in heaven, Lord, we praise your glorious name for resetting our eyes, for overseeing our souls, for calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We give thanks for the forgiveness we have through the death of your son on the cross. Lord, that when we think of the cross and we see the full weight of the wrath we deserve paid for by Christ, or we celebrate and we thank you for that is a measure of grace that we cannot fully understand. God, we do not understand why you would save us, but we know that you have done the work. You have justified us by your work alone, and you have conquered sin and death in your resurrection. We thank you for the forgiveness in Jesus. Lord, let us set our eyes back onto you, and let us not waver. Let us not be so easily distracted. Lord, help us in this work, and help us to realize that we are in this together and it is such a good thing for a church to remind one another to refocus on the good shepherd and in your name we pray and agree amen now's a time where we get to celebrate as a as a family the work of christ communion is um a vow renewal ceremony where we remind one another of the forgiveness that we have in Christ and the work of Jesus on the cross, where we refocus and we reset our eyes on Jesus and we remind one another of the good work that he has done on our behalf. Communion is for those baptized believers who are trusting and following after Jesus. And so if you're a member of this church or just attending this Sunday, if you are trusting and following in Jesus, we would invite you to take communion with us today. We would invite you to celebrate this feast of the Lord today. But if you are not a believer, you are not someone who is trusting in, or has trusted in Jesus as your Savior, I would encourage you to let the elements pass by you today. I want to tell you you're welcome, and we're so thankful you are here, but we would not ask you to um, swear allegiance and a vow to a God who you do not trust in. And a, and a savior who you do not know. And uh, so we would ask that you would refrain from taking the elef- elements this morning. In the same way, if you are uh, someone who has trusted in Christ, but you have found yourself in unrepentant sin, unable to offer this sin up at the cross and walk in repentance, we would encourage you to refrain from the elements today, that you will consider your heart that you would ask the Lord to forgive you and to reset your eyes, your mind, and your heart on him. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the disciples into the upper room, and they had this Passover meal. Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and he blessed it, and he told us that this is his body, which has been broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup, he raised it, and he blessed it, and said, this cup represents a new covenant in my blood which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. Later in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us that as long as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim him coming again. Amen, church? So we will partake and celebrate in the feast, this wedding feast, as we look forward for Christ to come again together.
If you're a child, go ahead and for Children's Church now. Our scripture reading this morning is from Luke 5, 12 through 16. While he was in one of the towns, a man was there who had leprosy all over him. He saw Jesus, fell on his face down, and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him and said, I am willing, be made clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then he ordered him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priests and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. But the news about him spread even more, and large crowds would come together to hear him and be healed of their sickness. Yet he often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. This is God's word. Thank you, Mike. So this last year and a half, we have been in this cleaning frenzy, have we not? Never have we spent so much money on disinfectant and sanitizer and masks and everything else. And I feel like a common phrase that was like used around our house all the time was, don't touch that. Don't put that in your mouth. Don't lick that. And I'm like, Lindsay, I'm a grown man. I can, you know, not, no, not really. Um, but, but, you know, we, we've just had this going on. Why, why have we been afraid of? What have we been concerned about? Well, we've been concerned about a virus. We've been concerned that something that we might touch or someone who might be around us might have been connect, contaminated by the virus. And there's this idea that if we touch something that is unclean or something that's contaminated, that we might at the same time become unclean too. It's why when I got my second shot, I'm like, all right, I need a doorknob somewhere where I can lick because then I'm bulletproof. Uh, But there's no longer that fear of becoming unclean. So when we turn to this passage in Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 16, we find a man who is ceremonially and physically unclean. And we have this idea throughout Scripture that if you are unclean or if you touch something unclean, then you have to go outside of the camp. You have to separate yourself from the people. And we find this very explicitly laid out for us in the book of Numbers, chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. In this passage, Moses tells the Israelites instructions on what to do if someone comes into contact with something unclean. This is what Moses tells the com- that tells the people, command the Israelites to send away anyone from the camp who is afflicted with a skin disease. Something like a, like a ringworm. This might be something along the lines of, of, of something even to the extent of like Hansen's disease where you lose your nerve and your feeling and eventually you lose uh, body parts as well. But he says, if they're afflicted with a skin disease, anyone who is or anyone who is defiled because of a corpse. Send away both male and female. Send them outside of the camp so that they will not defile their camps where I dwell among them. The Israelites did this, sending them outside the camp. The Israelites did as the Lord instructed Moses. So this passage talks about how if you touch something unclean, then you yourself become unclean and you have to be removed from the community. If you touch a corpse, if you have a skin disease, if you have a discharge, you have to separate yourself from the community. Legan Duncan, a pastor and theologian, says there are a few reasons why the Lord commanded this law. He said, in part, it's something that's very 
practical. The same reason why we're wearing masks and washing our hands more often is the same reason why they would send somebody outside the camp. There was no remedy. There was no cure for leprosy. And so in order to protect the camp, somebody had to be removed from the camp, removed from the people in order to protect the rest of the camp. There was a very practical reason. But then Legan Duncan says there's another very reason why there was this law about uncleanness or about touching something that was ceremonially or physically unclean. He said the other reason was a very theological reason. He said it said something about God. In Numbers chapter 5, he said, send them away, male and female, send them outside the camp so that they will not defile the camps where I dwell among them. In the Israelite camp, God dwelt among the people. And God was saying there's something theological happening here. He said, if I am God and I am a holy God, I cannot be a thing that is unclean. It's a theological statement that God is making in this passage. God is not merely acting as a physician. He is saying something about his character, his nature. If God is in the camp, those who are defiled need to leave the camp. And what this is, is a metaphor for sin. That sin represents something that defiles. That sin represents something that is unclean. And if sin defiles a person, then they become an outcast to God. When one sins, we are separated from God. Think about Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam and Eve, who who were pure, who were sinless, lived in a garden where God also dwelt. They would talk to him. They knew him. But as soon as they sinned against God, as soon as they rebelled against God and pursued their own desires rather than commands of God, what happened? God said, you're defiled by sin, and therefore you have to be removed from the camp. And so Adam and Eve were removed from the Garden of Eden. What we have law in Numbers chapter 5, this, this purity law, God is saying, I cannot be around something unholy or something that is unclean. And sin makes us unclean. Scripture tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the good news is this, is where we might fall into uncleanness because of our sin, we have a Savior who reaches out to touch us and who takes our sin away from us. And that's what we see a picture of in Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. In this chapter, these verses, we have a story of a leper. Now, Jesus' ministry is growing. People become him, people are being healed, sermons are being given, stories are being told. And so there's a man with leprosy, this skin disease. And we are told that this man's leprosy wasn't just a spot on his body, but that this man's leprosy was all over him. He was completely contaminated with this skin disease. That made him a physical outcast from his people. He had from his family, from his community. But not only that, in these days, this was also a, a spiritual picture as well. Because the people believed that if you were struck with a disease like this, then not only were you an outcast from your community, but you were an outcast from God as well. According to Leviticus chapters 13 and 14, if someone like this man had leprosy, What they were supposed to do is remove themselves from their community. And if ever somebody was walking along their way, they were supposed to raise up their voice and they were supposed to shout out, unclean, I'm unclean. That way, whoever was walking towards them would know that they were struck with this uncleanness or this disease and they could separate themselves. Why? Because they did not want this disease to spread. But when we look at this passage, we see Jesus, while he was in one of the towns, not outside the town, but he was in the town, 
there was a man who had leprosy who came to find Jesus. And look at what happens in verse 12. While Jesus was in the towns, there was a man who had leprosy all over him. He saw Jesus, and what did he do? Did he shout out, Jesus, I'm unclean. Did he remove himself from the community? Did he remove himself away from Jesus? That's not what we're told here, but rather we're told that this man went to Jesus. He went to Jesus. This took a level of of desperation, right? A level of boldness for this man with leprosy to go to Jesus. And I'm sure everyone else around Jesus who saw this man gave him a very wide berth. And as he went up to Jesus and laid on the ground before Jesus, I'm sure Jesus' disciples and the people in the crowd were like, Jesus, stay away from this man. Like if you touch him, you might get sick. Jesus, you're holy. You will be unclean if you touch this man. This man had a hopefulness, a desperation, a boldness that drove him to go to Jesus but it was a boldness that was marked with humility because he did not go to Jesus standing in front of him, but he went to Jesus, bowed down on the ground. So he approached Jesus in his need, but he approached Jesus with humility. And then he asked this very confident question. He begged Jesus, said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I want you to notice the confidence that he has here. He's not saying, Jesus, are you able to make me clean? It's not a question whether or not he thinks Jesus can do it or not. He knows that Jesus can heal him. He said, Jesus, if you are willing, will you make me clean? And I love what happens next in verse 13. Look at what happens next in verse 13. We see Jesus Responding with an action and with words. Jesus takes his hand. He reaches out to this man who is covered in leprosy. And he puts his hand on him. I just imagine that in the crowd at that moment there were gasps. Like the teacher, the rabbi just touched him. Maybe there were shouts of no in the crowds because Jesus reached out and he laid his hand on this man covered with leprosy from head to toe. And Jesus responded not only with his actions, but he responded with his words. He said, I am willing. Be made clean. And I want you to notice something very significant in this passage. We are not told that Jesus leaves this encounter defiled and unclean but rather the one who was unclean left cleansed don't miss the importance of what just happened here what should have happened is jesus becomes ceremonially unclean that jesus should become the outcast that he should be the one who is ostracized the community but no what happens is that this man in that instant was made clean and he went away from that encounter, spreading the news of what Jesus had for him. I think this passage, this passage is a very graphic illustration of our sinful predicament and our hope of healing that we find in Christ. This story is a graphic illustration of our own sinful predicament and the healing that is there for us in Christ. Because when we read scripture and we look at leprosy, we see that there are many parallels to the sin that's in our own lives. We know that leprosy, the skin disease, would corrupt the human body. But we also know that sin also corrupts the human heart. Sin corrupts the human heart. Oftentimes, this is a difference. Oftentimes, we think that, that, that sin is outside of us, that sin and temptation is out there in the world, and it's our job to kind of keep away from it. But what Scripture teaches us is that sin is so corrupting that sin does not begin 
outside of us that we might bump into it if we're not careful, but rather that sin begins in the human heart. Sin is within us, based in our desires, based in our longings, based in what we are willfully doing. On another occasion, Jesus was speaking to a crowd, and he says this. He said, listen to me, all of you, and understand Nothing that goes into a person from outside can defile him. But the things that come out of the person are what defile him. For from within, out of people's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, self-indulgence, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within us. And that's what defiles us. Not from what is outside of us, but from within us. Sin corrupts the human heart. Jesus said on another occasion, in fact, in chapter 6, he said it's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks, that our human heart is corrupted and leprous with sin. And we find when we look at leprosy, not only does it corrupts the heart, but we also see that it spreads and that it goes deep. How often have we said to ourselves in the conversations we have in our own mind, our own heart, this is how far I will go, but I will go no further. That this, if I go beyond this line, I'm falling into sin and I'm going to, I'm not going to cross that. But what do we do? We don't say, well, sin is over there. And that's nowhere I know I'll fall into sin if I cross that red line. So I'm going to stay far away from it. But what do we do? We say, if that line is sin, what do I want to do? I want to get as close as I can to it. Why? Because we like to feed that passion. We like to feed that desire. And we like to, in our own willfulness, get as close as we can. How many times has it happened to you, brother or sister in Christ, where you said, that's the line that I cannot cross, and then we find ourselves in the next moment stepping across it? Why? Because sin corrupts the human heart, but we also see that sin spreads. What used to scratch the itch of our desire no longer has its effect, and so we have to go a little bit further. And sin corrupts us and it spreads in us. And ultimately, what does sin do? But it condemns us as outcasts from God. In Scripture, we find that there was no remedy for leprosy. That if you contracted leprosy, the only thing you could hope for was that you would quarantine yourself as an outcast and eventually that leprosy would go away. And when we look at sin in our own heart, the result of sin is that it makes us spiritual outcasts, that we cannot, because of our sin, be in the presence of God. And we have to be declared as unclean. And we might say, well, what's the hope then? If there's nothing I can do, what is the hope And from your own goodness and from your own ability and from your own will, there is no hope. The only hope we have is the hope of the leper. The only hope that we have is that we come to Christ in our sin, in our helpless estate, saying there's nothing I can do about my sin, God. I need you to cleanse me. The only thing we can do is be like the leper and not come as one who is to one who is bowed low before Christ in humility. Like the leper, the only thing that we can do is be confident that Christ is able to forgive us of our sins and heal us. We're not seeking his ability. We're saying, God, are you willing? And we have this confidence that when Christ touches us, that we will be healed from our sins. There's the old hymn that I grew up singing. We still sing it in our family worship with our kids that goes like this. What can wash away my sins? Nothing 
but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Think of the leper. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The only hope we have in life and death in regards to our sin is that Jesus can make us clean. That just as when Jesus reached out and touched the leper, he will also reach out and touch us and give us life. And we have to realize, we have to realize that Christ is not stingy with his mercy. That Christ does not hold his mercy back in a bank and said, I'm holding it back and you got to prove to me you're good enough. You got to prove to me you want it enough. But rather, Scripture tells us that Christ's mercies are new every morning. That anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not people who, who have the discipline. Not the people who separate themselves from the own, But anyone who calls on the name of the Lord in their sin, while they're enemies of Christ, those are the ones who will be saved. And so we have to ask the question, how does Jesus cleanse us? What happens when he touches us? And what we find, and this is where numbers is so important. That book of Numbers, chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, if you touch something unclean, you have to go outside the camp. When we look at what Christ has done, Christ has touched something that is unclean. He has touched something that is broken. He has touched our sin. And so what had to happen? Well, Jesus had to go outside the camp. Jesus had to go outside Jerusalem. Jesus became a spiritual outcast with God. Why? Because he touched that uncleanness. He touched that sin. And he himself became unclean in that moment and God made him an outcast for us. Listen to what the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 13. It says, therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing his disgrace, for we do not have to We do not have an enduring city here, but instead we seek the one that is to come. What Hebrews is saying is that Jesus took our sins away by taking our sins upon himself. That he became the spiritual outcast. But I also want you to see what it says in Hebrews. For it says then, it says that Jesus went outside the camp. And it then says, let us go to him outside the camp bearing his disgrace. Once we have received the forgiveness of God, Christ Community Church, we then take on the disgrace that was on Christ. How how countercultural is that? Typically, what we want to do is not to be the outsider, but rather we want to be the insider. We don't want to be the one who is ostracized outside the camp. We want to be, to quote Hamilton, we, we want to be in the room where it happens, right? But here, The author of Hebrews is saying Christ was rejected by the world. He was rejected by God for your sin. Therefore, follow what he has done. Be willing to live in this world and have the world look at you and shake their head and say, what in the world is wrong with those people? We take on and we bear his disgrace, but we don't bear it in disgrace. We bear it as one who wears it as a badge. That we are in Christ. Because Christ became an outcast before us. He took on the defilement for us so we could put on 
his righteousness. As I was reading this passage, I started thinking, well, what about for Christians where they are, where they are following Christ, but then they fall into their old sins? They're redeemed by Christ, but then they fall back into the old patterns of their old way of life. What are they supposed to do? And as I was thinking about that and praying about that, I began to think of the book of Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, there's a story of Peter. And Peter is on the house, on the roof of Simon the Tanner's house, and he's up there fasting and praying. And Peter sees the story. It's a very interesting story. But Peter's on this rooftop. He sees this vision of a sheet dropping down from heaven. And on top of this sheet are all types of animals who are unclean. And there's a voice from heaven that says, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's like, no, Lord, never have I ever eaten anything that is unclean. And this happens three times. And every time Peter says, no, I've never eaten anything unclean. And you know what the voice from heaven replies every time? It says this, what God has made clean, do not call impure. What God has made clean, do not call impure. Paul says this in Romans chapter 8. He says, there, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Paul is agreeing with Luke in the book of Acts. He is saying, listen, if you are in Christ, no one can call you impure. If you are in Christ, there is no condemnation for you. Live stream's on. The live stream's working. All right. So here's, here's the thing, brothers and sisters in Christ. If you find yourself in this situation, you find yourself again in your sin, believe the words of the gospel. You are clean in Christ, that Christ has made you pure. You are not an outcast with God, but rather you are accepted and you are a loved son or daughter in his family. And let that promise drive you to your knees in praise. Book of Hebrews, after he talks about Jesus going outside the camp This is what he says in the next verse, our response. Since Jesus went outside the camp, therefore, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. Since we are pure in Christ and we can never fall out of that purity, the response we ought to have is that of praise. Now, the easy application is singing in church, right? We think of praise. We think of singing in church. And one of the things we said whenever we were planted a year and a half ago is we said we want to be a loud church that we ought to lift our voices boisterously and loudly and not care what other people are thinking about how bad we sound? Why? Because we have this great promise of purity. And I know we live in a society that's kind of done with singing and that we're only going to sing if we're in a concert of thousands of people and we can't even hear ourselves. But here's this oddness about being a Christian that when we come together, we have a sacrifice of praise on our lips because we're not only praising our God and Savior who's in heaven and who's with us now, but we're also encouraging our brothers and sisters in Christ who are around us. If you come to church weak and weary, falling into your sin, You should be surrounded by a cocoon of praise when you come into his church. So, brother and sister in Christ, let us not neglect to sing loudly to our God. 
But he also says two other things. He says, do not neglect what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. Here he's talking about the body of Christ, not just the sacrifice of praise of our lips, but he's also talking about one of the responses of being made pure by God is a deep love for his church. One of the things I love about our church is that giving just doesn't happen in the offering box. But from time to time, often I see members coming to the aid of other members whether it's helping them move to a new house or whether it's saying, you know, I got the stimulus check and I've never lost a job. And so they give it to someone else in the church who has a need. I see it time and time again of people reaching out and sharing with the body of Christ. You also, we need to realize that this is also a sacrifice of praise. That the body of Christ is so tight with one another because we share this bond of purity in Christ that the world looks at us and they say there is something different about those people. That when we're out at the park sharing hot dogs and we're sharing it with other people, the conversation ought to be so much filled with concern for the other that people say this is unique and this is different. That's the response of being made pure by Christ. So Christ Community Church, let us, I don't want to say let us start because you're already doing it, but let us continue in the good of caring for one another in the church. It's encouraging. It makes a difference. It's beautiful. I want to end with this thought. How else do we respond to being made pure with Christ And I want to go back to our story in Luke chapter 5. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus tells this man to go and show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for you and for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Jesus essentially told this man, I want you to go and be a testimony I want you to go and share with others how you have been cleansed. I mean, and as we read the text, we we see he wasn't supposed to tell anybody else, right? In Luke chapter 5. So it was bad that he disobeyed because as he went to, he told everybody what happened to him. And word got out and Jesus' ministry spread. But what we are told now that Christ has rose again, this ultimate picture that that the, the, the stench of death did not stick to Christ. Now we are told to not remain silent, but we are told to go everywhere sharing what Christ has done for us. I've used this example application before. I want to use it again. We need to be willing to tell other people what Christ has done. And one way that we can do that is through our Monday morning conversations. Whether you're at the gym, you're at work, you're at school, wherever you may be, people always ask the question, what would you do this past weekend? And we always tell everybody what we've done on Saturday. Well, I ran a 5K or I moved to a new house. But how often do we tell people what we did on Sunday? When somebody asks you about your weekend, what did you do this weekend? You know what they've done? They've taken this tee, they've placed it in the ground, and they put a golf ball right there on it for you. They have just teed it up for you to talk with them about what Christ has done. Because when you go into that conversation, it's like, well, I had a great weekend. We did a 5K on, on, on Saturday. But then on Sunday, went to church, and we talked about how Jesus cleanses us from our sins. And you just let it go from there. It might be that there's a follow-up question that they might have. It might be that there's just an awkward silence. It might be that that's the last time they ever ask you about your weekend. But it also might be that they have other questions about that, about what sin is, about how Christ can bring cleansing 
but we are stepping and putting ourselves into this position where we have the opportunity to tell somebody about the cleansing we have received from Christ. So Christ Community Church, let us continue to praise God with our songs, but also praise him with our words and deeds by telling others what Christ has done for us. Let's stand and pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. And we praise your name that you did us in our leprosy, but you sent us the remedy of Christ, who in his willingness put his hand upon us and took the leprosy of sin upon himself. We praise you, Lord, that he was taken outside the camp and paid the penalty for that sin. But we also praise your name, Lord, that he rose from the dead clean and pure, holy, and it's a sign that we can follow. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Remain standing for our benediction. Before that, don't forget we have the hot dog hangout uh, right at 12 o'clock. So we've got about 30 minutes. So if you can, Jason needs some help putting things away uh, because we've got to do something for 30 minutes while the co- hot dogs cook. Uh, so you can just ask him what you can do if you have the availability to do that. Uh, but otherwise, we'd love to hang out out the park and uh, share the light of Christ with one another and our community. For our benediction, Christ Community Church, this world is filled with sinking sand, with hopes that do not fulfill. So find yourself on the rock of Christ 
Studying yourself with his mercy and love, you are dismissed.
Yeah. There's one person watching.